brings to us. So, the brain is extremely complex. We only know, uh, we know much more than 10, 15 years ago, uh, ago because the fMRI uh, allowed us to develop uh, enormous uh, uh, progress uh, in this field. But uh, there is uh, still uh, lots and lots of things to discover. For instance, my uh, godfather of my PhD, um, Jean Jeu, uh, at the Institut Pasteur in Paris, works his whole life since the last 50 years on a neurotransmitter with nicotine. They just now, after 50 years, discovered how the nicotine um, neurotransmitter opens the alveole of the receiving part of the synapse. Because the synapse is one part with the neurotransmitters, another part the reception. And they see that in one millisecond, uh, there's an appeal by different action that opens that uh, receptor and that uh, brings in the, that uh, neurotransmitting element with nicotine in a cocktail of other things. And every of those uh, elements has his own rules and his own way of uh, practicing. So uh, medicine progresses also through that, through that fundamental research, but uh, we're far from mastering the expression of uh, the neurotransmitters in uh, the brain. But we know more and more how it works. And uh, we, uh, my old friend uh, Steve Lorraine, uh, worked on uh, limited states of consciousness. And he had great success with people in coma because, uh, because of the locked in syndrome, uh, he figured out that uh, about 40% of the people who were in coma were not uh, unconscious, were able to hear and to live through certain situations, although they were totally paralyzed. And he found in uh, fMRI uh, possibilities to identify them, and, and they, they, he had some uh, spectacular cases of. Uh, recuperation when they knew what, what really happens. But and that allows us to know now how consciousness works. That's very uh, recent uh, research where you see how here uh, this interaction, uh, because the, 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 the cortex, the thalamus, the striatum and the pallidum uh, are essential. Uh, and here it happens and this is the regulator. He blocks it. Now, he blocks it only uh, temporarily uh, or reduces its effect, but because you have different states of consciousness, you can be very conscious, you can be struck, you can speechless in front of something, or something happens to you and you see it and you say, okay, well, it's there and it doesn't affect me. Uh, well, people who have uh, an impaired state of uh, consciousness, well, they have mostly here in this inhibition system uh, 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 a dysfunction uh, element that makes that uh, the whole thing uh, shuts off. So now art uh, in a visual way, as long as we conceive art uh, as a, a cognitive perception, uh, happens here in those different aspects uh, of the different Brotman zones who are numbered from 1 to 30 and something. Uh, and uh, uh, they discovered uh, the last two years 90 subzones. So uh, we know more and more about the cartography of uh, the brain uh, every year and every day. Uh, and how those things function, so that allows us to uh, intervene. And here you have uh, the visual pathways and the cortex and the different elements who are essential to our awareness, to our uh, visual uh, senses. Now, uh, emotions. 
uh, are complex, uh, are uh, linked, uh, as we have seen, uh, to uh, a great number of uh, functional aspects uh, of the brain, who all intervene at a certain moment, at a certain degree, with a gradient uh, that is dependent on the meaning something has for us. Uh, pain and uh, fear uh, can be lived in a very different way uh, by different people. And uh, we live that in a society, and that society has its rules. Those rules are made by others and by tradition, and those traditions are ingrained in our epigenetic transmission because our, uh, uh, the evolution creates a transmission which was very slow. Our epigenetic inscription of how we, in events, change our life uh, affects much more rapidly uh, uh, our uh, genome. And um, that's why uh, events in life uh, can uh, change quickly and dramatically. Uh, certain uh, 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 aspects of uh, DNA uh, uh, to uh, uh, diseases, uh, disasters, uh, burnout, uh, depression, uh, name it. We not only have conscious perception, but also unconscious perception. Friend Lionel Lacache uh, wrote a nice book, only in French, unfortunately, of the uh, states of brain information uh, who uh, are born unconsciously, who can come to the conscious uh, awareness. And uh, it uh, depends on basically uh, what uh, the concern is and what the meaning we give, but also of what nature they are. But uh, in short, uh, you see here the conscious perception, how it works uh, in a very distributed way, and you see here the unconscious perception uh, that uh, things are registered and they don't amount to our consciousness. And you see that with hypnosis, uh, uh, some people can become aware of things they were not aware of consciously. Because some of those categories can come up uh, into uh, consciousness. Uh, and it's a form of attention, because things uh, fetch your attention uh, in a certain way, and that's all uh, brain physiology uh, in a very uh, precise way. And the horizon of our expectations uh, is uh, what we desire, what we expect, and is limited a little bit by what we know. But uh, the uh, craving of the nucleus accumbens uh, in the limbic system is a great problem for uh, drug abusers, for alcoholics, for uh, uh, people who uh, uh, smoke uh, uh, heavily, uh, and uh, there you see how the uh, craving uh, activity is uh, developing, and uh, we know now that uh, it's the receptive part of uh, the synapse uh, that uh, is, in a way, uh, uh, broken uh, and uh, permanently demanding uh, that creates uh, that addiction. And that since the cells are in every part of our body more or less uh, renovulated every 20 years, uh, that uh, it's very, very rare that people really uh, don't uh, uh, can resist uh, definitely uh, it's an uh, ongoing battle to uh, resist to that temptation and at the most unexpected moment it comes back. So uh, addiction 
uh, is uh, something that is still uh, very hard uh, to combat. Here we have uh, the, a kind of evolution of neural clusters, how they evolve in different parts of the brain, where they develop uh, their whole potential and at each of those stages they are upgraded by uh, the backlash uh, of incoming information, uh, the context and memory and history of uh, the self. Now, artists very early brought out emotion and art was initially mostly linked to uh, religious uh, or shamanic or uh, uh, natural philosophical uh, uh, elements uh, that were seen as above us. Dürer was one of the very early artists who, uh, uh, by impact of the, the Flemish, what they call primitives, or the late Gothic Flemish painters, who brought in a high degree of uh, uh, verisimilitude uh, uh, and reality in art, uh, who expressed in a uh, non-religious way emotion. Because up to 1500, most of the paintings were uh, religious. Uh, and there you see in 1514, uh, Dürer with uh, peasants. The peasants are dancing and having fun. And it was a great success because it was one of the first engravings. Engravings was then a new technique. It's like internet now. Uh, it allowed uh, the, the, the people to uh, share uh, emotion to uh, engravings and to paper. And that had uh, a great impact on a painter you know all, uh, Peter Bruegel. And here you see uh, his uh, old lady of the Pinacothek of München, it's a very small panel. But you see two things. You see that emotion. That, that, that. She's astonished. Uh, she's probably afraid uh, of the animal who flies around here. <laughs> and, uh, uh, <laughs> But uh, it's also painted with an incredible quality. If you go to the history of painting, you see that the quality requirement is different for every genre and every style at every moment. But that we all agree that some painters are more important than others. And that that consensus is somewhere given as a line, and uh, that's why you have gradations in music appreciation, painting appreciation, and in other things. Now, uh, you see here one of his uh, best paintings in the Vienna Museum, and you see a great number of different emotions. And uh, everybody here has another emotional activity, it's almost an encyclopedia of uh, emotion. And then the most stunning thing is here, uh, the music player who looks with one eye at us and concerns us. And uh, we all feel when somebody has an eye on us and looks at us uh, and we feel concerned. And the way that this emotion is expressed, you see better, is again an incredible form of pictorial quality. Uh, you see only the quality in the simple part of that white uh, uh, cloth he, he has. Uh, if you see the uh, facial expression uh, and the attention of the other, it's much more telling than in lesser quality uh, aspects of uh, painting. As you see here, uh, if we say that a painting like uh, the one I showed before is worth uh, 250 million, that will be worth uh, 15 or uh, 20,000. Because uh, not only the quality of the painting is less, but you see also the reducing of 
the visual expressions were much less believable. And it's like uh, uh, when you see somebody telling jokes on television, some people are believable, others are not, and when they are not believable, you, you shut off your television. Uh, uh, in art, it's a little bit the same, so you have uh, a, a gradation of a, a few thousand of uh, percentages. And it always comes to the same thing, as long as reality is in, in, involved and emotion is represented. The most expensive paintings are the ones who uh, have the most impact on the emotion of the beholder. And Bruegel uh, had a kind of uh, encyclopedia of emotions in a more or less impersonal way. He observed, while Adrian Brouwer, who was probably his best heir, uh, except uh, Rembrandt and Franz Hals, if we look in that area, we see that here uh, it's very complex emotion. Uh, the people who fight, uh, uh, here uh, he will stab the guy with a knife and he's angry, and that's the guy who cheated with the cards, uh, and that's why he is expelled and uh, molested in uh, this card game. But uh, Adrian Brouwer, who died when he was uh, 38 years old, um, was himself drunk. Uh, he spent uh, some years in the prison, but was so gifted that even during the eight or ten productive uh, years of his life, Rembrandt and Rubens collected actively his paintings and paid more for it than for their own. It's a kind of appreciation, who is a kind of peer review of the people with the smartest mind for painting at that moment. Because you can't be a big chef in uh, the kitchen if you don't taste very well. You can't be a great composer if you don't have a very perfect uh, uh, hearing system. Uh, and uh, that's... Uh, Applause from Rubens and Rembrandt and from many others made him famous. There's only 65 paintings uh, by uh, Brouwer left. Uh, and you see on a small panel of 13 and a half on 10 centimeters, it's about that. It was sold to the museum in uh, Washington, National Gallery. Uh, and it was sold for then, I think it's uh, 20 years ago, for like... Uh, Six hundred thousand uh, dollars at uh, that moment. Uh, such a small panel. Why? Because it's a kind of emotion that is hard to translate. But when you look at it and you see it in real, huh, it's flabbergasting, and you feel immediately that it touches you because your mirror neurons imitate a kind of. Uh, attitude uh, that young guy has and said, okay, let it all go. Uh, I'm not uh, famous, I'm not special, but uh, I don't care. Here you have uh, another of his paintings, was also very small, and you see peasants singing. But uh, the more senses are implicated in the representation of something, the greater is the impact of the emotion. So if you touch something, and you smell something, and you hear something, then there's an addition of impact. And for the brain, the emotion in the uh, with the result of the limbic activity in the nucleus accumbens uh, is upgraded, intensified, without we are able to know even if uh, fMRI or the systems, uh, uh, which uh, sense brings in the greatest emotion. And here the artist brought in uh, a great number of uh, uh, things. 
you have the uh, gesture of uh, the man singing. Uh, he is totally implicated in what he does. He holds his paper and then painterly. Uh, uh, the artist on such a small panel really worked on uh, the background in a very painterly way and in a way you see he with the back of his uh, uh, brush he scratched the material to make it uh, responsive to our feeling of texture and if you, we rub something we, we feel different things and if you're an artist the more you in, in, implicate uh, uh, different senses the more effective your work will be and I had years ago I was uh, uh, teaching at La Charité in Berlin and uh, uh, a young artist uh, came to uh, hear my courses and it was Elia Fury Lerson uh, I came uh, the second time I came to Kiev he invited me because he had I think it's now 15 years ago a big exhibition in the Pinchuk Art Center uh, and he made a big career uh, later on uh, because uh, he said, okay, I don't draw, I don't paint, uh, I will evoke emotion. Emotion through different things, uh, create a curiosity, curiosity creates attention, uh, and attention in a context where in an unconscious way, by incident approach and learning, uh, I create something. And that's also part of the art today as a new way of doing. And you see, if uh, the uh, earlier one here uh, is more like that, and it was sold for about $800,000, uh, you see the next one, uh, it was sold, the copy of it, by another artist of the same time, Mills van Krasbeek, with exactly the contemporary of uh, Brouwer, uh, was sold for 4000 But huge difference. Because here the uh, emotion is less believable. And it's a very famous small painting, so there were like five, six other artists who make copies out of it. And the worse is the copy, the less interest there is, because the only thing that people are really interested in is in the real emotion you see here. And that's why quality matters in the uh, expression of uh, emotion. And in between uh, the earliest uh, expressions of uh, emotion and the curiosity of the world we never understand totally and the symbolism and the power of religion it was Bosch and you all know uh, Jeroen Bosch who was uh, before Bruegel around uh, 1500 an artist who didn't innovate call him often uh, somebody who uh, uh, was a precursor of surrealism and surrealism in fact has some same aspects of that but that uh, strange reality of that mandragore you see here uh, uh, and uh, who is halfway eating St. John was the conviction and the belief of the people at that time because the belief the devil exists and uh, the um, uh, alchemy and uh, 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 bad practice was around and that monsters lived in the sea and came uh, to knock on the doors at night and in a very religious context like in Flanders or in Holland in the end of the 15th century. Everybody believed in uh, that. And so Bosch didn't invent anything. Uh, he painted what was common knowledge. And if you go to the Museum of Metz in France, uh, you see uh, the Germans, uh, when they occupied uh, that part of uh, the country, uh, built a great museum over six old uh, 14th and 15th century houses where the ceiling is painted in wooden beams where all those animals are and all those plants are and those are uh, maleficious plants 
And uh, now, when we uh, analyzed this painting in uh, the Lazaro Guardiano in Madrid, we saw that in X-ray, there was a man into the mandragora. I ah, see. Yeah. And here, uh, you see, there was a donor figure. And the material history of the painting is explained by us as such that somebody ordered that painting of St. John, a devotional painting, and probably with a Madonna uh, next to it, or uh, another religious team, and the gentleman died before he could pay. Or he didn't have the money, or he left, or uh, uh, he didn't took his commission. And the artist who well, had done uh, the painting, uh, and Bosch was a very famous painter at this time, uh, working for the Dukes of Burgundy and uh, uh, the great uh, uh, oligarchs of uh, their time. Uh, he had to do something, and uh, well, he made something out of it. Uh, and he saw St. John as uh, the uh, herald, the intermediary to combat uh, the bad uh, power of uh, that plant, Amandragora. Uh, now, uh, you see that uh, here uh, we have a whole series of not so great uh, expressions of uh, emotion. And in the, I see that the other part is blown away, but normally you should see underneath the better part. And in the 24 paintings known by Bosch, uh, when we did uh, the big exhibition in the Prado uh, uh, five years ago, uh, we discovered that there were two hands. A later hand of an, an assistant and the earlier hand of Bosch himself. This is the later hand of the assistant and we are sure of it because uh, this is a drawing by Bosch, the Madonna and Child. You see how perfect it is, how little he needs uh, and that it is a, a right-handed drawing. You see uh, that uh, to draw uh, all those aspects in the child's uh, uh, head and uh, the fingers and so on, all the lines are done with a right hand. And it was very uh, special to see that this was done with the left hand. So we have a left-handed and a right-handed thing, and there are almost no ambidextered things. Got it in football, but even then, uh, either Nazar or uh, Neymar, they have a better right foot than a left foot, or vice versa. So uh, that allowed us to uh, see that uh, there was not only a distinction in the quality of expression of emotion, but there was also a distinction in authorship and why those differences were very important. And then we saw that all those on the left side with the later part of the painting, and he was probably the cousin of Bosch who continued the studio. And that allows us to uh, come to the great emotional painter uh, of all, who was discovered around 1860 when photography was uh, invented. And photography was replacing painting in a certain way. And it focused on primary emotion. And here we see Rembrandt in the self-portrait, and he made many of it, but with incredible quality. And there was another Rembrandt that was made by parts of Rembrandt you see here in the Technical University in Delft. Google and financed by ENG Bank, uh, with some specialists, uh, of which I was in that uh, project, uh, they composed a number of elements that they fed into the algorithms of what they thought uh, 
Rembrandt should be, after analyzing all his works, and uh, in taking into account uh, 26,000 uh, small parts that were analyzed each in a certain way, three-dimensionally, uh, stratigraphy and all that. And that allows to make a computer-created uh, Rembrandt out of uh, 168,000 fragments that Rembrandt never painted. That's the power of uh, artificial uh, intelligence today. And, well, they resemble very much. But I think for most of you and for most of the Rembrandt uh, connoisseurs and lovers, uh, the right one is the better one. But the left one is so close that if you don't have seen uh, the right one, you think, well, this is Rembrandt. And it shows you the difference between first impression and what connoisseurship as a very critical uh, activity uh, requires to see such small differences uh, in similar uh, things. And today we are with deep machine learning, artificial intelligence, uh, uh, ameliorated uh, humans, uh, transhumanism, and probably uh, within a number of uh, years or decades, transhumanism, where during, uh, by the fact that the artificial intelligence of robots can correct their own algorithms and create new ones who escape totally of human control, they will run their own business themselves. And so, what will I be at that moment? Will the human uh, context in which we see art uh, differ from the ones robots see their art? Because uh, in discussing with some of the, the top specialists uh, on the world level of this, uh, they say, oh, well, uh, the quantum energy in computing uh, will be a, a big, big, big advance. But the most important thing will be when we can give to robots and computers and artificial intelligence a life story, emotions, and expressions. That's what we have to think over for the future. Thank you. If you have questions,
Well, uh, the industry uh, practiced already the last of the discoveries in neuroscience by neuromarketing. And in analyzing our emotions and the way they work, uh, they target you with uh, a number of aspects who will fool uh, your perception uh, and the input of your senses to give you an idea that uh, fake vanilla is like vanilla and fake chocolate is like chocolate and a vegan burger uh, uh, tastes like a hamburger. And uh, on the other hand, uh, one of my colleagues at the Brussels University uh, started with me a project uh, about uh, 15 years ago about uh, art-related uh, uh, therapies uh, for burnout uh, patients with different degrees of uh, 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 the depression or borderline. And we saw that uh, basically uh, the two had to go together, that it was in a way opening their minds in uh, uh, addressing their uh, refusal of uh, the impact of uh, the, the context and the society around them with one of the aspects of uh, depression, uh, that people close them off and feel they are not able to do something, that art uh, uh, creates a new curiosity. And that, that curiosity can be strongly stimulated if they themselves, in fashion, tactically, manually uh, produce art. And we have in Belgium a very famous museum of a great psychiatrist, uh, Dr. Guilla, uh, who does since uh, 1880 exhibitions of uh, psychiatric patients. And we see that there are very interesting works of art uh, in a very special way, and we feel that there is uh, an inner struggle uh, who uh, is often very merciless and difficult, uh, because the, the biggest thing uh, we have to combat for all that kind of diseases is the inner anger. The anger created by uh, the, the, the lack of power you have to determine your own condition. Life is beautiful, when you're in charge of yourself, when you have the means and the ability and the uh, potential of doing what you want to, like to be, and when that makes a sense for you. And if you don't have that, uh, you have a frustration, and all kinds of frustration is a form of anger, and expresses itself there. And one of the few ways of addressing in a non uh, pharmacological way and uh, in a subtle way is to create with them uh, an emotion, an emotion who is shared, uh, even if they feel it as something private for themselves, to bring them in to great art and we see that the greater the art is, uh, uh, the better it works. So a copy of Bruegel will not have the same impact as the real painting of Bruegel. Uh, a projection of a Bruegel will not have the impact as the painting, because the painting gives 10,000 times more information than the image of the painting. And that is why art is a successful evolutionary strategy to escape the reality. And in the case of patients, that reality is not always a happy reality. Well, it's a very interesting question, and it was our first uh, little discovery that we saw when we put uh, people in the uh, fMRI at the Welcome Institute in London, and we showed them the image of the pond of uh, Giverny by Monet, and we saw the, uh, we showed them the water lilies painted by Monet after that. That it was more or less the same sequentiality of activity in the brain, but that there was another uh, higher and 
different additional reaction to the painting of the same. And we did then the same tests with Cézanne, uh, the Mont Saint Victoire, uh, and uh, the beautiful painting, uh, and a photograph as close as possible to that painting. There we saw that again there was an additional reaction. The additional reaction was a, a higher degree of abstraction and reduction because towards the complexity of the real reality you see in nature, the art is an abstraction and reduction of that reality with ours. And if it's shared, it's from us all. That's why we like uh, more and pay more for uh, a painting by Cézanne than for a photograph uh, of the Mont Saint Victoire, unless it would be a great photograph. And then again, photos is a reduction of reality. And if that is so telling and meaningful for us, it will have an impact, and it will be essential for us. But there are slight differences in the additional uh, physiology of the brain assessment of art and non-art who are visible in fMRI. Um, art is an experience, all experience of life, every moment, your brain changes. And your brain changes physically. And uh, you see that uh, the development of your brain starts when you're in the womb of uh, uh, your mother and uh, it goes on basically expanding until at uh, 20, 24 years old you have all the capacities and all uh, the, 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 the um, uh, concepts who had to be developed like uh, speech and thought and uh, movement and coordination and all that, when those are developed with the right stimulation at the right moment, uh, gives you a potential and a capacity. That's why somebody like uh, Neymar has a spatial view uh, of a complexity incredible and his periphery view uh, when he plays football is uh, uh, fantastic and without really thinking, he sees how the others move. Uh, that creates experience, e experience is information and by the abstraction, the different levels of the cortex of your brain create, it becomes an abstract information that you can communicate with others if you understand it, but that is for you the most uh, efficient way of incident learning. And uh, like that, uh, you progress. And so it's an effect of the art on yourself that by its incident learning uh, creates uh, an evolution in your brain. Can be positive, can be negative, uh, it all depends. Uh, you have depressive people who uh, are very, very uh, struck by a certain music or uh, certain paintings they see because it, it, it is an aggression of uh, their own fragility and uh, uh, it encounters their own uh, 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 anger uh, in this case. Uh, and uh, <coughs> what uh, we never, like said Heidegger, uh, you never go twice through the same river. So the river changed and yourself you changed uh, and those two uh, different things are the evolution of human intelligence. Because for me, the greatest form of intelligence is the one who can uh, harmoniously stabilize for a short moment the greatest number of uh, unstable variables. such an extraordinary lecture. We'd like to thank you for coming to our university. Thank you. And we are going to tell you that from now and on, you are the honorary visitor of our university. Welcome thank you very much.
I send you also this uh, digital. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So uh, you can put it with uh, each of this also. You can put it with the PowerPoint. Yeah. Uh, and this